There's this series of engravings by William Hogarth, depicting a young man who comes into an inherited fortune. Think Pip from Great Expectations, innocently gazing around the townhouse of his tight-fisted father. The Rake's Progress tells the story of Tom Rakewell. A rake, of course, is a sort of like a cad, hellraiser, womanizer. As soon as he comes into money, his fiancée's out the door, and he's womanizing and cavorting and gambling. His newfound wealth takes him on an adventure through London's decadent society, through a raucous house party to a night at the Rose Tavern brothel, where he gets syphilis before falling into a desperate marriage for money to a rich old maid. And ultimately, he ends up penniless, diseased, and, and in Bedlam prison. His work so often comments on the trappings of alcohol and particularly class. Ah, class, that very British preoccupation. The UK is very class-bound. It is very much a feature of contemporary life. I don't think it's gone away. And it's part of everything that we, we see and do. It's been with us for so long and the inequalities that come with that. So how have artists throughout history reflected and poked fun at class observations? And what role can artists have in highlighting social inequalities and creating change? All right, let's stay on satire for a minute. Hogarth was only one of many artists throughout history that used biting humour to criticise and even break down class barriers in society. The Victorians were particularly obsessed, as we can see from this book by William Nicholson, which captures the class dynamics of the era. Whether queen's dandies or humble urchins, shapes and sizes are toyed with, and no one is spared from his satire. Much like Honoré Daumier's distorted pencil drawing takedowns of the upper classes, toad-like old women, mean lords with crooked noses, and overblown high fashion. More recently, Yinka Shonabari's Diary of a Victorian Dandy plays off Hogarth's work, an aristocratic tableau that brings questions of race into a contemporary exploration of social mobility and class. Whilst Edinburgh's Moina Flanagan referenced class in her early work, twisting and distorting her subjects. Moina Flanagan works a lot with archetypes, kind of middle class archetypes. I always think of them as being kind of characters that you'd see around the new town. You feel like there's always something slightly exaggerated, almost slightly monstrous actually in some of them. Somebody's neck is just slightly too long or their nose is just slightly too pointed. I think she's quite comfortable with kind of that kind of humorous kind of approach as well. While some use satire and humour to explore social dynamics, other artists throughout history have brought viewers closer to home through stark, often domestic depictions highlighting the realities of inequality and poverty. Scotland's William Strang forged a career largely out of triumphant portraits of the upper classes, but by contrast his depictions of poverty are brutal. He was definitely from a sort of realist school of thought. His mother's family were shipbuilders, so he certainly identified with the working classes and considered himself to be working class. Full scenes of darkly lit, overcrowded rooms and forlorn figures reveal the desperate situation that many found themselves in. Around that time, photography was beginning to emerge, a new lens through which to reflect on class. So Edith Tudor Hart was a really fascinating photographer, kind of overlooked and forgotten for a long time. She represents workers' struggle, she represents working class families and working class lives with dignity and without judgement. She was very much coming from a position of knowledge and experience, lived experience as we would call it today. Even earlier, Thomas Annan captured Glasgow's slums in the mid to late 1800s, which are now like this amazing time capsule for the housing conditions of the poor at the time. Haunting albumen prints revealed dark, wet streets and the impact of industrialisation on the inhabitants of the city. All of these artworks bring personal realities to an often intangible topic. This kind of documentary photography runs through to today. Um, I love the works of Milton Rogovan particularly. He is a photographer whose clear outset was, was to address issues of inequality. And there's a famous quote from him that the rich have their own photographers and he wanted to photograph the forgotten. And what he does in these photographs is he photographs the miners in their environment, but also he's keen to show them at home as well, to show the richness of the community. I, I grew up in a mining community and I saw that as I was growing up, that it's, it was not just about the mines, it's about the people around, everyone who worked in the town was connected to mining somehow. 
and it's that community that brings them together, and that's what he wants to depict. Of course, ultimately, we're circling around something here. Class and fine art are inevitably inextricably linked. It's a huge, thorny, complex topic, one that we can only begin to scratch the surface of. It is quite a difficult thing to discuss from the people that make art to the people that curate the art to the people that work with the arts and the institutions, the level of privilege people come from make it really complicated. You cross a certain hurdle, you change your perspective of how you treat people. I think it's kind of inescapable. It comes from like our past, so it's not something that we're just dealing with at the minute. Because fundamentally, art has always relied on the wealthy. It's always been the case. Art has always needed patrons. If we're looking back into ancient art history, there's a lot of money there where patrons would literally have themselves painted into the artwork. You only have to look around this building and it's just full of wealthy people in their finery, the kings and the queens and the landowners. They don't speak to most people's experience. And it isn't just about buyers. Artists themselves and many roles within the creative industries are dominated by the upper classes, increasingly so in recent decades. Consistently, people from the higher managerial and professional occupations, so things like medicine, law, so on, had about four times the probability of getting into creative work as people from working class background. Art has always had a barrier to entry, first and foremost, from the perspective of education. It's a difficult discussion even here in the galleries. If you start asking how many people are privately educated, how many people come from like, you know, diverse backgrounds. Art schools are full of upper middle class people these days. Sorry, I feel really depressed about it. But it's more deep rooted and complex than just that. It's very much seen in sort of policy terms or by senior people as a problem about training about experience, but that's not really true. People who are just basically given those opportunities, say nepotism, don't understand like those experiences of that sense of working the way up. You know, the people who are in a position to change that have also benefited from the current process, and that's very uncomfortable. But outside of employers, what can be done? We have to make culture accessible to everyone, otherwise it does end up being this preserve of the upper middle classes. It's about having an intention to have a relationship with an audience that is different. Quite often it's about finding some other way into um, the artwork. For example, we do a lot of work with music here at National Galleries, so it may be that somebody comes in because they're interested in the music and then they experience the artworks that are kind of connected to it. What the art world itself can do is focus on individual stories. Thinking about the, the more the statistics of it, people are also individuals as well as a member of, of a class. Because through art, we can humanise the statistics, like in Kirsty Mackay's The Fish That Never Swam project. This project started in response of something that was previously known as the Glasgow Effect, which was talking about the uh, life expectancy in Scotland in general, but particularly in Glasgow. She was working from statistics that came out the previous years. A kid is on a bike on the, on the one side of the line and basically depending on what side of the line you were born, it was such a big difference on, on life expectancy. And I just really enjoyed how visually that kind of like very clear line was kind of telling you your life is going to be completely different if you're born on this side of the line or the other side of the line. I think the sensitivity that Kirsty has documenting the place where she was from and the stories of the people around her just clearly define why it is important to have working class artists talking about class. And this lived experience is at the heart of it all, something important across all of the arts. It's telling a wider range of stories with authenticity of actually understanding the background to certain stories and actually how that feels and how things happen. A full range of different people in society and that those perspectives are uh, told with some, with some empathy and with some nuance. If we want to have a diverse collection, we need to have diverse artists. There's no way to be talking about these topics if we don't hear them from the people that are kind of experiencing them. It's a fight. It's going to be an endless. It seems like a fight that's not going to end in a long time. So it has to be pushed and be fully aware. I don't feel like the UK is obsessed enough about class. <laughs> it should be a lot more obsessed about class and a lot more upset about class.